Welcome to chapter one, studying human sexuality. So this chapter is just going to provide us with a brief overview of how we're going to approach the course and also talk about how we develop the information that we are going to be discussing in this course. So the different ways that we do research to get the information that we have about human sexuality. So um, we should probably start with the definition of human sexuality. So human sexuality is defined as an area of research and study focusing on all aspects of humans as sexual beings. And like I said in this chapter, we're going to talk about the different ways in which we do that research um, to uh, study all the aspects of human sexuality. So we're going to approach human sexuality by examining two broad areas, your experiences and your understanding. Um, and we'll talk about that briefly at the beginning of this chapter. Another thing that we hope to accomplish throughout the course is for you to develop um, your own personal sexual philosophy, which is a person's unique foundation of knowledge, attitudes, and actions relating to what the person wants and who or she is as a sexual being. And a lot of our personal uh, sexual philosophy depends on our morals. Um, so just to be clear, our morals are defined as a person's individual, unique attitudes about what constitutes right and wrong. So hopefully throughout this course will help to define your personal sexual philosophy a little better if you haven't already done so. Okay, so this is our first lecture activity. What I suggest that you do is open a... Word document or uh, whatever program you use that's equivalent to that. And um, then go ahead and label your uh, Word document with your name and then chapter one. And then we'll just start kind of a running list of these lecture activities for this chapter. So the next label after chapter one would be uh, lecture activity number one. And then what I'm going to have you do for lecture activity number one is type up two to three questions that you have about human sexuality that you'd like this course to answer. And I understand that this is like, you know, we're just meeting each other, so it can be a little awkward and a little uncomfortable. Um, but I assure you, I've taught this course many times and nothing surprises me. So go ahead and write down your two to three questions that you hope this course uh, will address and answer. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to start by um, focusing on our um, experiences of human sexuality and how this course should help us to experience human sexuality and relate to our experiences with that. So the first thing that it, uh, this course hopefully will accomplish is that it will enrich our self-knowledge. And this course should help us to learn more about our own sexuality beyond just our gender and orientation. But to be clear, gender identity is defined as the sex, male or female, that a person identifies himself or herself to be. And it doesn't always match their biological sex. And then um, sexual orientation is defined as terms specifying the sex of those to whom a person is primarily romantically, emotionally, and sexually attracted to. Um, it's likely that there are some people in this course that aren't sure of their sexual orientation, and that's perfectly okay. So here are some questions that this course will address, hopefully to help you enrich your own self-knowledge. So the first question is, how can you ensure a physically, emotionally gratifying sex life? The second question is, do you know what you want and don't want in a sexual partner? Third, what type of person and what situations would help you feel comfortable being intimate? What does a healthy relationship look like? Are you sure you'll make decisions that are right for you in sexual situations? How will you keep yourself safe from STIs and violence? And finally, how will you interact with people sexually different from you? Okay, so another experience that you might have while you're taking this course is um, a bunch of different emotions. So sex is emotional and it is normal to experience emotional reactions to the topics that we discuss. Anything from confusion to anxiety, embarrassment, arousal, surprise, anger, nervousness, and fear are all common emotions students feel in this class. Okay, so we're also going to talk about developing morals and values um, when it comes to experiencing human sexuality. So how do we develop our morals? Um, from parents, from church, from friends? Our morals change as we reevaluate them, so really only you can decide 
what morals to keep and what morals to discard. But without a moral compass to guide us, we are more likely to make decisions that we regret. In our experiences of human sexuality, hopefully this course will help us to make responsible choices. Choosing to be sexually active requires a lot of responsibility. We have to make decisions like how are we going to protect ourselves from STIs, avoid unwanted pregnancy, stay safe from violence and exploitation, sex and relationships. Um, when we look at that, what, what are we um, looking for? What are our belief systems? So how do we feel about multiple partners, about monogamy, about how long you wait to have sex? Um, so we need to consider all of those things um, and make sure that they are congruent with our morals and values and then make choices that adhere to those. So also when it comes to our experiences with human sexuality, it's important to note that sex is more than just intercourse. Western cultures such as ours equate sex with intercourse only. Everything else is considered foreplay that leads to sex. But this is not true. Many STDs stem from oral and anal sex, some even from kissing. And so some people find more sexual pleasure in acts other than intercourse. So it's important to think about what else is considered sex besides intercourse. Okay, and finally, uh, hopefully this course will help us to enhance our sexual fulfillment. This class will give you information that can enhance consensual, honest, and responsible sex between adults. Uh, this course is not encouraging any particular sexual behavior, and the rule of thumb is if it makes you uncomfortable, don't do it. So hopefully this class will also give you a better understanding of human sexuality. Um, one thing that we can that we will talk about in this class is um, sex education versus abstinence only courses. And studies found that people who take this course, um, which is more sex sex education, make better, more informed, and more thoughtful choices about sex. For example, people who take this course have a lower tolerance for rape and rape myths. High school seniors that take this course have fewer high risk sex behaviors. And college freshmen who take this course use more contraception. So some schools, though, don't offer sex education classes. Alternatively, they may offer abstinence-only education. And this is the decision to avoid teaching adolescent students about sexual activity, STDs, contraception, etc., based on the theory that such education is unnecessary if students are taught to abstain from sexual behavior altogether. But studies show that this does not decrease teen sex activity, uh, STDs, or unwanted pregnancy. In fact, in some schools that do abstinence-only education, these things increased. So a lot of students report that human sexuality is actually more complex than they thought. So to understand sexuality fully, we will cover the anatomy, physiology, psychology, and social factors in sex. So let's uh, look at this video that talks now about those complexities. Good morning, John. Today, we plumb the depths of the marvelously complex human. But first, allow me to acknowledge that I am not a sociologist. I'm also a straight white man who doesn't have to worry about a lot of the hate that a lot of other people do have to worry about. But my goal with this video is I want people to understand, because I think understanding will lead to less hate and also less self-hate. For a lot of people, it's nice to imagine that humans are simple and that you can know a person's sex and then you will know all sorts of things about them deeply and clearly. And if you don't fit into this nice little box, people People who do can get really confused and sometimes even angry. And if you yourself don't fit into one of these nice little boxes and you think that people should, then you end up hating yourself. And that's probably even worse. I think the best and maybe only way to solve this problem is for people to understand that there are no nice shiny boxes. Or if there are shiny boxes, there are an infinite number of them. Enough to put all of the people who currently exist have ever existed and will ever exist. So, together, let's understand. We're gonna start simple. What's going on down here, in between the legs? That is your sex, your biological sex, and it tends to be binary, though there are all sorts of conditions that result in intersex individuals. And as interesting and complicated as this is, the rest of it is much more complicated, so I'm just gonna move on from here, because we all kind of get what sex is. Now we move on up to the top, to the brain, which is the thing that decides what gender you identify with, whether you feel like a man or a woman or neither or both. Because the fascinating thing is, as much as we try to label things, there is no way to label every point on an infinite continuum, and that's what we're 
we're dealing with here. So, to actually visualize how this works, I've created a graph for you. On the x-axis, we have gender, male to female, and on the y-axis, we have the intensity of the identification with that gender. I would be about here, because I identify as a man, though I recognize that there are some womany parts of me. But let's also put a hypothetical biological female on the graph that identifies very strongly as a man. Now that could be really uncomfortable, especially when there's a bunch of people in the world who insist on calling him a woman just because of the body that he happens to be very uncomfortable with. Which is why sex does not determine the pronoun you should use. Gender does. Now, moving on to your heart. Your metaphorical heart, of course. This is who you're attracted to. Men, women, all genders. Again, it's a spectrum, and that spectrum includes intensity, because there are people who don't feel strong sexual attraction at all. That's why asexual is a sexual orientation. A newer idea that I was happy to be exposed to yesterday on Tumblr is the idea of romantic orientation. These are the people that you want to have strong, intimate relationships with, but it sort of separates out the idea that sex has to be the goal or end point or, like, end all and be all of every intimate relationship. Now that we've dealt with how we feel, let's deal with what happens when other people actually get involved. Now that's sexual behavior, which is actually very different from sexual orientation. Now that might seem a little bit strange at first, but it's not. Consider, for example, a heterosexual priest. That priest's orientation is heterosexual, but because of his religion, his behavior is celibate. Here we're not talking about the preference, we're talking about the behavior. Now built on top of all of this are gender roles, which are built by societies, not by individuals. The obvious ones are masculine gender roles, and feminine gender roles, but as all dichotomies are false dichotomies, this one is a spectrum too. Now that we've sort of gone over all of this, it's important to note that every single one of these categories is independent from each other. So a biological female can be a man who only has sex with women despite the fact that he's attracted both men and women, and kind of you know, feels more comfortable in feminine gender roles. That may not be the most common combination of these factors, but it's certainly not weird. And another important point, many people move across these spectrums, sometimes from year to year, sometimes hour to hour. But what's really important is that we trust ourselves, and we understand ourselves, and we love and respect ourselves, and we grant that same understanding and respect to the people around us. Because when the world becomes one of infinite continuums, and those false dichotomies break down, and those two shiny boxes break apart into seven billion shiny boxes, it's actually pretty beautiful. John, I'll see you on Tuesday. Much of what people know about sex is actually wrong. So think about where you learned about sex. Was it from your friends, your peers, TV, parents, school, etc.? Most of our sources are actually not scientific and incorrect, which can cause unrealistic expectations and conclusions, like a pigeon drops off a baby, for example. Our early sex experiences are, are also a poor teacher. They can be unpleasant, painful, awkward, scary. So this course is scientific. Be open-minded even if the information contradicts your existing beliefs. For lecture activity two, I would like for you to tell me where you learned about sex. So was it a friend? Was it a family member? Um, and you can just give me two to three sentences on this. For example, my sister taught uh, me about sex. She was the person who taught me about it. And I just one day was asking her questions like, what's an erection? And I remember my sister is 10 years older than me, so she was giving me really age-appropriate answers like, an erection is when a penis stands up and says hello. I remember that was her answer. And as my questions, you know, over the days kind of got more um, detailed, then she started pulling out her human sexuality book and she would go over things with me and show me pictures, a lot of which I don't think I was actually ready for because I was like nine. But um, nevertheless, that was kind of how I got my sex talk was through my sister. So um, give me an example like that in two to three sentences of how you first learned about sex for lecture activity two. And you'll just add on to uh, the document that you already have open. So this will go right after lecture activity one on that same document. Hopefully this course will give us a greater understanding and respect for sexual diversity. One's sexual personality depends on a lot of factors like their culture, religion, morals, family background, sexual orientation, attitude, sex behavior, preferences, experience, sex role, expectations, and their comfort level. But studies show that students who take this class are more empathetic towards others and have an increased comfort level with different types of sexuality from their own. So a lot of people come into this class kind of wondering if they're sexually normal or not. So we're going to talk about what is sexually normal. But keep in mind, it's actually pretty hard to define normal. But most people who take this course find that their desires, feelings, and behaviors are very common. 
Hopefully in this course you'll gain a better understanding of sexual health, which is a general concept that refers to physical, emotional, and psychological and interpersonal well-being. Um, so we'll talk about STDs, which we actually refer to as STIs. Um, the term for that has been updated. So now we call it sexually transmitted infections, like genital warts, gonorrhea, HIV, and AIDS. Um, and then we'll talk about problems with sexual dysfunction, like erectile dysfunction, uh, um, being unable to orgasm, premature ejaculation, low sex drive. We'll talk about the health of your sexual anatomy. So um, looking at things like breast cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, testicular cancer. We'll talk about emotional and psychological sexual health issues like past sexual abuse or guilt. And we'll talk about abnormal behavior and or um, abnormal appearance of sexual body parts. And then also, hopefully this class will have you think about uh, what you will or would say to your kids about sex if and when you become a parent. And studies show that people who take this course are actually more likely to talk to their kids about sex and do it accurately and comprehensively. All right, now we are going to move into kind of the second part of chapter one, which focuses on research in psychology. Uh, psychology does uh, want to be respected as a science and to do so there is an expectation that you use the scientific method and you can support your theories and claims with research that is valid and reliable and again based on science and some quantitative measurement uh, meaning there's some math done as well which is why in psychology we employ the use of statistics which we'll talk about a little bit later um, but to start off this discussion let's go ahead and watch a crash, uh, crash course video on research in psychology can we go pizza cause psychedelic hallucinations does coffee make you smarter or does it just make you do dumb stuff faster like much of psychology itself questions like these can seem pretty intuitive i mean people may not be the easiest organisms to understand but you're a person right so you must be qualified to draw like some conclusions about other people and what makes them tick but it's important to realize that your intuition isn't always right in fact sometimes it is exactly wrong and we tend to grossly underestimate the dangers of false intuition if you have some idea about a person and their behavior that turns out to be right Right, that reinforces your trust in your intuition. Like if I warn my buddy Bob against eating that deep dish pizza that's been in the fridge for the past week, but he eats it anyway and soon starts to wig out, I'm gonna say, dude, I told you so. But if I'm wrong and he's totally fine, I probably won't even think about it ever again. This is known as hindsight bias or the I knew it all along phenomenon. This doesn't mean that common sense is wrong. It just means that our intuitive sense more easily describes what just happened than what will happen in the future. Another reason you can't blindly trust your intuition is your natural tendency toward overconfidence. Sometimes you just really, really feel like you're right about people when actually you're really, really wrong. We've all been there. We also tend to perceive order in random events, which can lead to false assumptions. For example, if you flip a coin five times, you have equal chances of getting all tails as you do getting alternating heads and tails. But we see the series of five tails as something unusual, as a streak, and thus giving that result some kind of meaning that it very definitely does not have. That is is why we have the methods and safeguards of psychological research and experimentation and the glorious process of scientific inquiry. They help us to get around these problems and basically save the study of our minds from the stupidity of our minds. So I hope that it won't be a spoiler if I tell you now that pizza won't make you trip and coffee doesn't make you smart. Sorry. <laughs> In most ways, psychological research is no different than any other scientific discipline. Like, step one is always figuring out how to ask general questions about your subject and turn them into measurable, testable propositions. This is called operationalizing your questions. So you know how the scientific method works. It starts with a question and a theory. And I don't mean theory in the sense of, like, a hunch that, say, a quad shot of espresso makes you think better. Instead, in science, a theory is what explains and organizes lots of different observations and predicts outcomes. 
outcomes. And when you come up with a testable prediction, that's your hypothesis. Once your theory and hypothesis are in place, you need a clear and common language to report them with. So, for example, defining exactly what you mean by thinking better with your espresso hypothesis will allow other researchers to replicate the experiment. And replication is key. You can watch a person exhibit a certain behavior once, and it won't prove very much. But if you keep getting consistent results, even as you change subjects or situations, you're probably onto something. This is a problem with one popular type of psychological research, case studies, which take an in-depth look at one individual. Case studies can sometimes be misleading because by their nature, they can't be replicated, so they run the risk of overgeneralizing. Still, they're good at showing us what can happen and end up framing questions for more extensive and generalizable studies. They're also often memorable and a great storytelling device psychologists use to observe and describe behavior. Like, say the smell of coffee makes Carl suddenly anxious and irritable. That obviously doesn't mean that it has that same effect on everyone. In fact, Carl has terrible memories associated with that smell, and so his case is actually quite rare. Poor Carl. But you would still have to look at lots of other cases to determine that conclusively. Another popular method of psychological research is naturalistic observation, where researchers simply watch behavior in a natural environment. Whether that's chimps poking anthills in the jungle, kids clowning in a classroom, or drunk dudes yelling at soccer games, the idea is to let the subjects just do their thing without trying to manipulate or control the situation. So yeah, basically just spying on people. Like case studies, naturalistic observations are great at describing behavior, but they're very limited and explained. It. Psychologists can also collect behavioral data using surveys or interviews, asking people to report their opinions and behaviors. Sexuality researcher Alfred Kinsey famously used this technique when he surveyed thousands of men and women on their sexual history and published his findings in a pair of revolutionary texts, sexual behavior in the human male and female, respectively. Surveys are a great way to access people's consciously held attitudes and beliefs, but how to ask the questions can be tricky. Subtle word choices can influence results. For example, more forceful words like ban or censor may elicit different reactions than limit or not allow. Asking, do you believe in space aliens, is a much different question than, do you think that there is intelligent life somewhere else in the universe? It's the same question, but in the first, the subject might assume that you mean aliens visiting Earth and making crop circles and abducting people and poking them. And if how you phrase surveys is important, so is who you ask. I could ask a room full of students at a pacifist club meaning what they think about arms control, but the results wouldn't be a representative measure of where students stand because there's a pretty clear sampling bias at work here. To fairly represent a population, I'd need to get a random sample where all members of the target group, in this case students, had an equal chance of being selected to answer the question. So, once you've described behavior with surveys, case studies, or naturalistic observation, you can start making sense out of it, and even predict future behavior. One way to do that is to look at how one trait or behavior is related to another, or how they correlate. So let's get back to my buddy Bob, who seems to think that his refrigerator is actually some kind of time machine that can preserve food indefinitely. Let's say that Bob is just tucked into a lunch of questionable leftovers, pizza that may very well have had a little bit of fungus on it, but he was hungry and lazy, and so he doused it in sriracha. Suddenly, he starts seeing things, green armadillos with laser beam eyes. From here, we could deduce that eating unknown fungus predicts hallucination. That's a correlation, but correlation is not causation. Yes, it makes sense that eating questionable fungus would cause hallucinations, but it's possible that Bob was already on the verge of a psychotic episode, and those fuzzy leftovers were actually benign. Or there could be an entirely different fact involved, like maybe he hadn't slept in 72 hours or had an intense migraine coming on, and one of those factors caused his hallucinations. It's tempting to draw conclusions from correlations, but it's super important to remember that correlations predict the possibility of cause and effect relationships. They cannot prove them. So we've talked about how to describe behavior without manipulating it, and how to make connections and predictions from those findings, but that can only take you so far. To really get to the bottom of cause and effect behaviors, you're gonna have to start experimenting. Experiments allow investigators to isolate different effects by manipulating an independent variable and keeping all other variables constant, or as constant as you can. This means that they need at least two groups, the experimental group, which is gonna get messed with, and the control group, which is not gonna get messed with. Just as surveys use random samples, experimental researchers need to randomly assign participants to each group to minimize potential confounding variables or outside factors that may skew the results. You don't want all grumpy teenagers in one group and all wealthy Japanese surfers in the other. They gotta mingle. Now, sometimes one or both groups are not informed about what's actually being tested. For example, researchers can test how substances affect people by comparing their effects to placebos or inert substances. And often, the researchers themselves don't know which group is experimental and which is control, so they don't unintentionally influence 
the results through their own behavior. In which case, it's called, you guessed it, a double-blind procedure. So let's put these ideas into practice in our own little experiment. Like all good work, it starts with a question. So the other day, my friend Bernice and I were debating. We're debating caffeine's effect on the brain. Personally, she's convinced that coffee helps her focus and think better, but I get all jittery like a caged meerkat and can't focus on anything. And because we know that overconfidence can lead you to believe things that are not true, we decided to do some critical thinking. So let's figure out our question. Do humans solve problems faster when given caffeine? Now we gotta boil that down into a testable prediction. Remember, keep it clear, simple, and eloquent so that it can be replicated. Caffeine makes me smarter is not a great hypothesis. A better one would be, say, adult humans given caffeine will navigate a maze faster than humans not given caffeine. The caffeine dosage is your independent variable, the thing that you can change. So, you'll need some coffee. Your result or dependent variable, the thing that depends on the thing that you can change is going to be the speed at which the subject navigates this giant corn maze. Go out on the street, wrangle up a bunch of different kinds of people, and randomly assign them into three different groups. Also, at this point, the American Psychological Association suggests that you acquire everyone's informed consent to participate. You don't want to force anyone to be in your experiment, no matter how cool you think it is. So the control group gets a placebo, in this case, decaf. Experimental group one gets a low dose of caffeine, which we'll define at 100 milligrams, just an eye opener and like a cup of coffee's worth. Experimental group two gets 500 milligrams, more than a quad shot of espresso dunked in a Red Bull. Once you dose everyone, turn them loose in the maze and wait at the other end with a stopwatch. All that's left is to measure your results from the three different groups and compare them to see if there were any conclusive results. If the highly dosed folks got through it twice as fast as the low dose or placebo groups, then Bernice's hypothesis was correct and she could rub my face in it saying she was right all along. But really, that would just be the warm flush of hindsight bias telling her something she didn't really know until we tested it. Then, because we've used clear language and defined find our parameters, other curious minds can easily replicate this experiment and we can eventually pool all the data together and have something solid to say about what that macchiato was doing to your cognition. Or at least the speed at which you can run through a maze. Science. Probably the best tool that you have for understanding other people. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Psychology. If you paid attention, you learned how to apply the scientific method to psychological research through case studies, naturalistic observations, surveys, and interviews, and experimentation. You also learned about different kinds of bias and experimentation, and how research practices help us avoid them. Thanks especially to our subable subscribers who make this and all of Crash Course possible. If you'd like to contribute to help us keep Crash Course going, and also get awesome perks like an autographed science poster, or even be animated into an upcoming episode, go to subbable.com slash crash course to find out how. Our script was written by Kathleen Yale and edited by Blake DiPastino and myself. Our consultant is Dr. Ranji Bhagwat. Our director and editor is Nicholas Jenkins. Our script supervisor is Michael Ronda, who is also our sound designer, and our graphics team is Thought Cafe. Okay, so as the video pointed out, we used the scientific method to uh, address questions about human behavior. So the first step in the scientific method then is to ask a question, uh, think of or observe a behavior that invokes some type of question regarding human behavior, such as why isn't a person texting me back might lead you as a psychologist to research what causes people to be attracted to other people, uh, what causes people to reply to other people in communication forums, and then the second thing that you do is form a hypothesis, which is essentially an explanation or answer to your question. Um, it is based on observations. A hypothesis is derived from theory. Uh, so we don't just pull hypotheses out of thin air, but instead we look to existing theories to help us answer our research questions and we formulate our hypotheses that way. Uh, it's important that we operationally define our hypotheses, which means we translate the hypothesis into a specific testable procedure that can be measured and observed. So, for example, if we were interested in studying how much college students party, we would have to operationally define the term party. Um, maybe we would operationally define party as drinking alcohol. Uh, in which case we would then have to operationally define what drinking alcohol meant um, in regards to partying. So is partying drinking uh, four mixed drinks in a night? Is partying drinking 20 mixed drinks in a night? Or are we defining partying as the number of social events you go to in a weekend? So operation, operational definitions are very specific and allow us to have a guideline of measurement. The next thing that we would need to do is design an experiment to test our hypothesis. 
Um, and then after we do our experiment, which we'll look at a bunch of different methods of experimentation and uh, research coming up in this chapter momentarily. Uh, but after we have conducted our research, we would have to um, draw conclusions based on the results of our research. Did we support our hypothesis or not? And then finally, we have to report our results. And generally, the way we report our results in psychology is we write a article which gets published to a scientific journal after being reviewed by other psychologists to make sure that the experiment holds up to the standards of uh, psychology and the scientific method and that the statistics were done correctly and that um, everything is valid and reliable. And if so, um, then the paper will get published into a, a scholarly journal, which then people in the public can read we have a database uh, at the college that you can go on to and read the various articles on psychological research um, in these scholarly journals. So there are two broad categories of research. Uh, you can do as a psychologist what's known as descriptive research, which is where you just describe a population as it exists, but there's no manipulation involved whatsoever. And then there is experiments, uh, which does involve manipulation, and we'll talk about that later. So let's look at the different types of descriptive research. There is naturalistic observation, there is participant observation, um, and we'll talk about some more descriptive research momentarily. But let's start by taking a more in-depth look at naturalistic observation. In naturalistic observation, we are just... Uh, recording what we see in a natural environment, whether it be observing animals or observing people. Perhaps we want to see how children behave in a daycare center after their parents have dropped them off. And so we would just watch them behave um, maybe from behind a two-way mirror so they couldn't see us. And then we would just record what we observe. We're not interacting with the children or manipulating their behavior in any way. Uh, we're not giving half of the children sugar and the other half are not getting sugar and then we're watching them uh, and drawing conclusions about how sugar affects their behavior. We're, we're not doing that. We're just observing them in their environment as they exist naturally and as they behave naturally. And then there is participant observation, which is where we do get involved uh, in the research. And so the population or sample of people that we are observing uh, know that we are there as researchers. Uh, this is called overt participant observation. Generally, we will do this if we're interested in studying a culture that we're unfamiliar with. We might ask them if we can join in their day-to-day -day life, and then we would eat with them and uh, recreate with them and get to observe their different behaviors. There's also what's known as covert participant observation, and generally this is reserved for studying populations that typically don't want to be studied. Uh, so maybe cults or prisoners or gang members. Uh, and then you would go kind of undercover into the group or the culture so they wouldn't know that you were there to research them. Um, but you would be acting as though you are one of them and you would be collecting data. So as you can imagine, uh, this definitely has its pros and cons. Uh, the pro to covert participant observation is that you can get some uh, really unbiased data. When people know that they're being watched, they often behave differently. We call this phenomenon the observer effect. Um, and so when you are doing covert particip participant observation, people don't know that they are being watched for the purpose of research, and so you can get some really uh, great data in, in terms of it being completely unbiased. However, uh, it's dangerous in that you might be asked to do things that go against your morals, ethics, uh, could go against the law, uh, could be potentially dangerous to your well-being. Um, so it, it can be something that you need to uh, be very cautious with. One of the things that we have seen that's kind of interesting with covert participant observation is what's known as going native. And going native is when a person that is a researcher is doing covert participant observation, but pretending to be a member of the group. 
And then they actually kind of get sucked into that group and start to identify with that group and will abandon their research and become a legitimate member of the group. Uh, one example of this was that there was a psychologist who was studying a group called Pro Anna, who believes that anorexia should be treated as a lifestyle choice and celebrated and not treated as a disease. And so they have these online forums that the researcher joined and after about three months, she started to uh, embrace the philosophies of Pro Anna and she abandoned her research and actually became an actual uh, member of Pro Anna. Okay, so for lecture activity three, we're gonna try our hand at a uh, naturalistic observation. So what I want you to do is watch the following video, and as you watch it, count the number of times that you obs observe someone ignoring the flash mob. You can just make tally marks on your Word document, um, and so what we're going to consider ignoring the flash mob is uh, talking, walking away, looking at their watch, putting their head down, just generally seeming uninterested and not paying attention to what's going on. So uh, give it a shot. And then after the video's over, I'll tell you how many people um, I had a, um, a, a teacher's assistant count the number of people that, that weren't paying attention. So I'll tell you what number we came up with when you're done watching and um, see if you got close or not. And then if you didn't, I'll have you explain why it was difficult to um, get a more accurate number. So for now, just go ahead and watch the video and then mark each time you see someone not paying attention to the flash mob.
Okay, so I had my TA go through the video frame by frame very slowly, and she observed 75 people not paying attention to the flash mob. Most students don't get anywhere close to that, um, and that is the point of the activity is just to show that while this type of research sounds really easy, it's actually pretty difficult. So what I'd like you to do for lecture activity three is tell me how many um, people you did observe not paying attention, and then give me two to three reasons why this type of research is difficult or why you didn't get a number close to 75 if you didn't. And, and most people don't. Most people get like four, ten numbers like that. So uh, two to three reasons why it was difficult and the number you did get. And then the next type of descriptive research we're going to talk about is laboratory observation. And so uh, we can research human behavior in a lab setting Generally, we do this when the natural environment just isn't practical for research, meaning you need special equipment like MRI machines or PET uh, scans or one-way mirrors, computers, EKG machines, etc. Um, this gives the observer a lot of control over the variables, which is nice. We can make the room the temperature we want so that someone being hot or cold doesn't affect their behavior. Um, in other ways, we can kind of control for the variables, any variable we think that might affect behavior. So that's nice because we do have that control and we can see just the pure effects of uh, whatever we think is causing a behavior, causing that behavior. However, it does create an artificial atmosphere and people tend to act differently when they know that they're being observed or even just being in a laboratory or kind of that sterile cold environment. So our findings might not be uh, entirely pure. All right, the next type of descriptive research is survey research, and we've all taken surveys before. This is uh, in terms of psychology, when we ask a person their opinion about themselves or, their, uh, uh, or other people. Uh, so we obviously can't survey everyone in a population. Like, let's say that we wanted to know how people in America feel about Justin Bieber. We couldn't ask everybody in America because not everyone has a phone if we wanted to do this uh, via telephone. Or uh, some people are um, overseas on vacation or they're uh, soldiers. Or some people might have a medical problem like they're in a coma. Uh, you can't answer a survey about Justin Bieber if you're in a coma. Or you might be a baby and so you don't uh, speak words yet. So you can't participate in a survey about Justin Bieber. So since we can't ask everybody in a population uh, our research questions, what we have to do is take a sample, which is a smaller group from the population. And that sample has to be representative, uh, which means that they represent the population well. So all uh, facets or aspects of the population are accounted for. For example, if we got a sample of the population of America, but in our sample we only had 50-year-old men, and we asked them how they felt about Justin Bieber, uh, this sample would be unrepresentative and would cause us to get a distorted view on Americans' perspectives of the Bieber. Obviously, there are some drawbacks to uh, the survey method. Uh, we can have a bad sample, like the 50-year-old men example I just gave. People lie on surveys. Um, they want to put their best foot forward and make us like them, so they might tell us information that's not entirely true. They might not remember accurately. They become acquiescent, which just is a fancy word for they get bored. Um, and so there's a lot of ways in which we can structure surveys and construct them to try to avoid these problems that are inherent within the survey research method option. Um, we can get rid of uh, obvious desirable answers. We can ask the same questions over and over again so that if people have stopped paying attention and are no longer reading the questions, we could catch that. So there's ways that we try to correct for the cons of survey research, but none of these methods are perfect, and surveys are certainly not a perfect method either. And then the next uh, type of descriptive research is correlational research. And so this is a, a little bit of statistics. Uh, in psychology, like I mentioned, there is a quantitative expectation in our research, which means that there has to be some element of math. And so a correlation is a statistical method that allows us to measure the relationship between two variables. 
Um, there is a slogan, a motto, a mantra that we say in statistics, which is that correlation does not imply causation. So with correlational research, we're just seeing if there is any relationship between two variables. We're not saying that one variable causes an effect in the other variable. Um, but this is often um, done in the media, so they will take correlational research and report it as cause and effect relationships, and it really distorts and manipulates ideas um, in psychological research. So, for example, uh, in the 50s, there was an article published that said, ice cream causes murder. And this was actually based on some research that looked at if there was a correlation between ice cream and murder. And of course, there is a statistically significant relationship between ice cream and murder. But as you know, with correlations, we cannot imply causation, uh, which is exactly what this newspaper article did. The reason that there is a correlation between murder and ice cream is because of hot weather. So when it's hot, we know violent crimes increase, and when it's hot, we know that ice cream sales increase. But to say that because that correlation exists, we can conclude that ice cream causes murder would be ridiculous. Um, and so this is where we need to implore that saying, correlation does not imply causation. All right, and then we have the experiment, and this uh, is no longer an element of descriptive research because in the experiment, we are creating some type of manipulation. Um, and so we are going to go through now the different components of an experiment. There's a lot of terminology here that you'll need to know for the exam, so make sure that you take good notes. As you know, one of the steps in the scientific method is to formulate a hypothesis. So let's say that we have a hypothesis that violent TV programs increase aggression. Uh, what we would need to do is we would need to manipulate whether or not people got to watch violent TV and then observe their aggression levels as a means of seeing if there is a relationship between violent TV and aggression. And so in the experiment, the manipulation of a variable is done to see if corresponding changes in behavior result. And it is that manipulation of the variable and the control that we have of who gets the manipulation and who doesn't get the manipulation that allows us to determine cause and effect relationships. So let's look now at the variables in the experiment. Uh, we have two variables. We have independent variables and dependent variables. The independent variable is the variable we are manipulating. And then there is the dependent variable, and the dependent variable is the variable that we are measuring. So it's called the dependent variable because it depends on what happens with the independent variable. You could think of the independent variable as the cause in the cause and effect relationship, and the dependent variable as the effect in the cause and effect relationship. So if we're looking at this example hypothesis of uh, does violent TV cause aggression, then we would say that violent or, or that aggression depends on violent TV, and so aggression would be our dependent variable. If we look at uh, light and plant growth, we could say that plant growth depends on how much light it gets, so plant growth is our dependent variable. To that point, uh, we could manipulate the light, right? So we could have two identical plants, and one plant gets light, and one plant doesn't get light. And so lights are independent variable, and we're manipulating that independent variable, and in that we're manipulating what plant gets light and what plant doesn't get light. And then we could uh, do this for two weeks, let one plant get light and one plant not get light. And then after the two weeks, we would go and we would measure how tall the plant was, and the plant growth itself is what we're measuring. And so what we are measuring is called the dependent variable. So in an experiment, we also have groups. We have an experimental group and we have a control group. The experimental group is the group that receives the manipulation, also known as the treatment, and the control group does not receive the treatment or the manipulation. And so the reason we have these two groups is by having the control group, we have a comparison group. So if we were giving a violent TV to the experimental group, so they would receive the treatment of watching violent TV, we would have the control group 
um, not watch any TV. And then after an hour of the experimental group watching TV in the control group, just sitting around reading books or something, uh, we could then ask them to interact with each other. So all the people in the experimental group interact and all the people in the control group interact. And we could see if the people that watched violent TV were more aggressive than the people that did not watch violent TV. And again, it is that control that allows us to determine the cause and effect relationship. So we're comparing the two groups, the group that got the independent variable, the variable we think is causing the behavior, and we're comparing that group against the group that does not get the independent variable and seeing if the uh, reception of this manipulation causes the effect that we've hypo hypothesized it would cause. So we've talked about the idea that we take a representative sample from a population, but then once you have your representative sample, how do you decide who goes in the experimental group and who goes in the control group? Because if you just, as the researcher, walk around and pick people, there might be some bias going on there. So maybe I'm the researcher and of course I want my hypothesis that violent TV causes aggression. I want that supported. So maybe I unconsciously, unintentionally go around and I pick out people that I think look more aggressive and I put them in the experimental group. And in this way, they'll be more aggressive and my hypothesis will be supported, right? So the way to avoid that is through random assignment. So once I have my representative sample, I can flip a coin, roll dice, pull names out of a hat, and then I am not in charge of what person from my sample goes in what group, who's going in the experimental group, and who's going in the control group. So in psychological research, the basic idea is that when you have a representative sample from a population, you want to um, treat that sample as though all the people in it are as similar as possible. Um, and so maybe you have all the people in the sample come to the lab at the same time. Maybe you have all the people in the sample go to bed at the same time before they experiment and eat the same thing in the morning. And they're all in a room that is the same temperature. Um, and so basically you're treating them as though they are the exact same. The only difference is if they're in the experimental group or the control group and whether or not they received your manipulation. So if you had a group of people that was exactly the same and half of them watched violent TV and then half of them didn't, and the people that watched violent TV were significantly more aggressive, then you could, could conclude that violent TV causes aggression because these people were exactly the same. The only thing that was different is whether or not they watched violent TV. However, practical logic uh, tells us that, you know, no matter how alike we try to make the participants in our research, they're not the same, and we can't control for all of the variables that might cause someone to be aggressive. And because of that, we can never use the word prove in psychological research. Instead, we have to say that we have found a significant difference between the group that received our independent variable and the group that did not. There haven't always been ethics in psychological research, and later in the semester I'll show you some experiments uh, that did not imply these guidelines for ethical research, but they do exist now and they are called um, the APA Guidelines for Ethical Research. APA is the American Psychological Association, or the psychology cops as I like to refer to them. And so the ethical guidelines include that participants must be protected from physical and mental harm during research. They have the right to privacy regarding their behavior, so their results and participation has to be anonymous. Uh, participation must be voluntary. We can't force someone to be a part of psychological research. And uh, participants must be allowed to make an informed decision about their participation. Um, so they have to sign a document stating that they have been told the basic outline of the study, they're aware that their participation involves any risks, if there are risks, and they must be aware that they can terminate participation at any time.